Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling the uh, regular meeting of the Planning Commission to order for Thursday, November 8th, 2018. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment of silence for those that were killed in Thousand Oaks uh, last evening. If we could do that, please. Okay, thank you all. Um, Ms. Vaughn, would you call roll, please? Thank you, Chair Wiscom. Here. Vice Chair Lodge. Here. Commissioner Campanella. Here. Commissioner Schwartz. Here. Commissioner Thompson. Here. Commissioner Higgins and Jordan are absent. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Okay, we're going to move on to item number two, which is preliminary matters. Uh, Ms. DeBusk, request for continuances, withdrawals, postponements, or addition of X agenda items. Yes, I have one announcement. Um, Chair, item number three at 11 Anacapa has been postponed indefinitely at the applicant's request. Thank you. Okay, and item uh, 2B, announcements and appeals? None. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to item number 2C, and this is comments from members of the public pertaining to items not on this agenda. Uh, and everyone is limited to two minutes. Um, if you are yielding your time to a particular speaker, that's fine. Uh, maximum amount of time would be uh, up to 10 minutes. And you must be present in the council chambers if you are yielding your time to another speaker. And this will apply also to the next item coming up. So we're gonna start with general public comment. We have a couple speaker slips. Um, Mike Gorga, is that right? It's Gorgita. Gorgita, ah, Gorgita. I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. Please come on up to the podium. And I've got this set for two minutes and just for the benefit of everyone that's here, there is a, a timer on the podium so you can kind of see when you need to wrap up your comments. So um, welcome. Welcome. I'm just up here to um, talk about planning and the AERB board and what goes on in their decision making. I live on the east side and a big time money man has bought a lot next to me and he is put, he's going to put in three units right next to my house. And I went to the meetings and I went to the concept reviews and I've done all that, but it seems like it's all cut and dry before anything ever goes out. I mean, I've made, I brought up issues about a fuel tank that's in, that was in this yard that the owner told me about, this man who bought the lot from this owner that I talked to had the tank dug out on the weekend. I actually saw the pump that went to the tank. He tried to sell the pump to me. And then when I made a comment to the ARB board, they brushed it off like nothing was gonna happen, like they weren't gonna do a soils test and they weren't gonna check it out. Same thing with the um, solar access. My lot faces 41 degrees north and I went to the city yesterday. I looked at the plans, the plan said 41 degrees. The AR, the, I mean the solar access is 40 degrees and lower. So basically they're gonna block my view out with this big two-story um, condo unit and I made a, statement about that and they just brush that off oh no it's 39 degrees on their plans it was 39 degrees on the city's plans it was 41 degrees so i'm having a problem here i'm thinking that something is corrupt in that situation when it changes for the benefit of a big time builder with big time money who owns a big time apartment complex on cliff drive and city college then we have a problem and you all know him, his name's Ed St. George. So that's my comment. Um, my last comment is, is that parking is ridiculous in Santa Barbara. We need to do something. We need to have a parking review board or something because people park in my in front of my house and walk two blocks away to park in the high density areas on the Lower East Side and oh. it's, it's really bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, um, our next speaker is Anna Marie Gott and um, is Thomas, I can't read this. Uh, Stansbury. Stansbury, okay, so you're here. Um, 
and R. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Um, Ms. Scott, you will get um, six minutes. Let me just put this up here. Okay, welcome. Good afternoon, commissioners. I actually brought you a few pieces of paper to take a look at. If you could actually get, get this and put it in front of you, I would appreciate this. This is about the same issue that Mike just spoke about, which is 101 South Canada. It is owned by Edward St. George. He is proposing three condominium units with 10 bedrooms, six parking places, and six bathrooms. That is a substantial amount of bedrooms for this particular area. The notice that actually went out to all of the neighbors did not state the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, or the number of parking places. All it said was three units. It said that there would be some discretionary findings that were required for an open, yard, uh, open alternative yard as well as environmental review. Mike brought up the issue that this particular lot had had a gas tank removed on the weekend by workers after St. George purchased the property. And that now debris is over that particular area. I also found out today from Mike that the grandfather and father had actually operated a mechanic shop at that location using unknown fuel cleaners for all of the parts that they use to work on the cars. He told the staff hearing officer yesterday about this. It was completely ignored. Also what was ignored is the fact that ABR members, four of them saw this in March of this year. Two of those members are going to be gone by the end of the year. One is already gone and one will be gone. The next time this is heard in front of any of the ABR members, there will be an entirely new board who is now paying more, much more attention to compatibility findings. They, as you know, have been paying much more attention to it since the appeal at 501 East Mitchell Terena. One of the issues that they I am sure were convinced not that they were not going to be able to rule on was the reduction of bedrooms or bathrooms to reduce the size, bulk, and scale, and to actually increase the compatibility with the neighborhood. Staff, if you don't, are not aware of it, actually often tells the HLC members as well as the ABR board members that they are not allowed to do anything to reduce what the interior of the house is or the building, such as square footage reduction by removing a bedroom or a bathroom. If you take a look at one of these handouts, this is from the ABR guidelines. Number four says reduce the overall floor area of the building by decreasing the average unit size, number of units, bedrooms or bathrooms per unit. Yet staff tells ABR that they are not allowed to do that. My request to you, we want to avoid an appeal. I asked yesterday in the meeting to please, before this, the staff hearing officer was going to make a decision, refer it back to the ABR. This is an entirely different ABR right now who is making decisions on, house, uh, on um, projects. The compatibility findings they made, when this comes back to them, how are they going to make them if the staff hearing officer has decided that the size, bulk, scale, and mass of the current project is acceptable? Will they be able to do it? They made a comments on a comments only agenda regarding compatibility, and they made no deliberative findings. They simply read off the compatibility findings, and that was it. As the board that would actually see an appeal from the staff hearing officer, can you please help us avoid an appeal and get the staff hearing officer to redirect this back to the ABR? 
the ABR needs to fully reconsider not just the compatibility findings, but also the decisions that they have been making regarding the reduction of bedrooms or bathrooms that they have been told that they cannot make and they cannot take action on by staff. This is a 10 bedroom, six bathroom, three units. How many vehicles, if you have students living there, will we have in an area of town, town that is already substantially impacted by parking problems? I had to go to Flamingo Mobile Home Park recently. I drove around for an hour at seven o'clock at night trying to find parking. One of the gentlemen that testified yesterday said he often cannot get out of his driveway because someone has parked just past the curb cut and he can't get his vehicle out. One of the people testified that people come from blocks and blocks away to park in their neighborhood because there is no other parking somewhere else. Yes, we need housing, but we have to have a livable city. Please do something. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have no other speakers, so um, I am closing general public comment. Um, Commissioner Lodge, did you have something? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I am concerned about some of these issues that have been raised. Uh, Ms. Ostrander, what is there that uh, might be done to get some attention? I, one of the things that concerns me is my understanding is that the ABR or the Planning Commission can't reduce density, but can they not reduce the size of the units? I'm not sure where the this project is with regards to uh, the ABR. I think ABR, it's, it's 101 gone through Kenyatta. PDA or not, but oh. yeah. so just with regards to your specific question, whether they can reduce the um, the size of the project. The Housing Accountability Act speaks to a uh, number of units. So the, the size is, if it's compatible or size mass scale, that can be addressed through design. No, we've closed public comment. So, uh, no. I, I wanted to I'm, add, I'm, I'm, answer the I'm, PA. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, we can't get into a discussion about this item up here um, because it's not on the agenda. So, the rest of us pardon? The rest of us we, okay. Thank you. No, I, do you have something to add, Commissioner Campanella, that, that, that uh, as long as we don't get into a discussion, even with our uh, attorney, about this item because it's not on the agenda. So if you have something that might help. Uh, I would like maybe at a lunch meeting or a future meeting that, that uh, uh, our, our, uh, those comments uh, relative to what can be done or not done under the Housing Accountability Act uh, involve some more discussion and Q&A. Okay. Future meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Duly noted. Commissioner Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a process recommendation for us to consider uh, on a going forward basis, and we can discuss that with city attorney's office and staff. I noticed that Mayor Murillo on Tuesday of this week both read an important educational statement, first of all, so the public and decision makers could understand the scope of public comment in relation to the decision makers, but, um, and as important to, as that was, I also thought it was enlightening and perhaps we could consider assisting the public in understanding where they can take their questions in terms of process, administrative process. So for those who have concerns or questions on particular matters or particular policies, where can they appropriately and effectively direct them? Uh, I'm sure that over time it could be frustrating for the public to continue to come during public comment, but feel they don't understand or are not availed of a constructive process that allows them to engage with government. So. Um, to Ms. Ostranger and staff, I would recommend that we be able to, through our chair, perhaps uh, read a statement. I don't know if that's at every planning commission 
uh, opening for general public comment, but I think going forward, and what I heard from Mayor Murillo, hopefully is a very educational and of assistance to the public and decision makers in assisting the public in having their questions and uh, concerns uh, aired and um, effectively addressed. Thank you. Great, I think that's, that's a, um, a great idea and I'd be happy to be involved in that. Um, Commissioner Thompson? Yeah, I would second what Commissioner Schwartz said, but I'd also point out to the speakers and the public that the ABR doesn't work for the Planning Commission. We have no jurisdiction. We can't tell them what to do or not do. So it's we may agree with what you're saying, but we can't do anything about it. There is a better venue, as Commissioner Schwartz pointed out. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, it, I, I agree with the comments um, made by Commissioner um, Campanella and Commissioner Schwartz that we should have a process by which you can go to city staff and, and get your problems addressed. So I think that's something that, that probably we need to work harder on clarifying. So, um, okay, that's fine. Um, we, item three is postponed indefinitely, so we're moving on to item number four, which is a discussion item, which is an update on the new police station. So we're gonna hear um, the way this will work. I gather you're all here to hear about the new police station. And what we're going to do is get a presentation from staff and then hopefully just really, um, um, important questions first, not important, but, but questions from planning commissioners that, that really should be addressed as we continue to, to, um, to enlighten the, the process and the selection. And then we're going to open it up for public comment. And if you'd like to speak, you have two minutes and you can spill, fill out a slip in the back and hand it to Ms. DeBusk and she will be happy to um, Make sure it's up here. And again, there's a little timer on the podium. Don't be nervous. Um, it's a pretty easy process, and we're happy to hear from all of you. Um, and then it will be back to the commission for any additional questions and then a discussion. So this is um, a discussion item only, uh, update on the new police station. So Ms. DeBusk, would you like to introduce staff? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair Wiscombe. As you mentioned, this is a courtesy presentation to update the Planning Commission on where the city is in the process of selecting a site for the new police station. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to Brad Hess, who is the Principal Project Manager. Madam Chair and Commissioners, thank you for this opportunity to bring you up to speed on where we are with the police station. Uh, the goal for today will be to provide you with uh, some history of where we've been to bring you up to speed on where we are currently, and then to tell you our next steps and, and the future. I have with me a team, uh, Sarah Issa, who's our senior planner on the project. I have Brian Cornell, who's our, uh, the principal architect, uh, our local architect. And I have Suzanne Elledge of uh, Suzanne Elledge Planning Services, who um, all will have an opportunity, hopefully, to speak. So to orient you, uh, the blue line is the existing police station the red line <clears throat> red boundary excuse me is the annex which houses about 40 full-time employees and about 20 volunteers what you don't see on the on there is uh, the two other locations uh, of the animal control which is behind fire station three over on sola street and the dispatch center which is located in the parking garage The existing police building was built in 1959 and was uh, occupied in 1960, and it was for about a staff of 85. Designed as an essential services facility, it's open 24-7. And currently, there are 211 officers and staff. In addition to that, there are part-time staff, and then there are additional volunteers of between 40 and 50 people. Currently, as with four, uh, four locations, in spite of those four locations uh, and the spread out of operations, they are doing a fantastic job. In an old building such as this, there are several building deficiencies, however. 
In addition to the space and operational deficiencies, there are infrastructure deficiencies because it's a, an old building. There's plumbing, electrical, uh, those types of things. Additionally, there are, have been many seismic upgrades since 1960, as you can imagine, for California. And uh, for a, an essential services building, this building does not meet that code. There were fuel tanks uh, underneath the building, or underneath the parking lot, rather. And so currently, there is some uh, in mitigation for uh, the soil contamination that is there. And uh, as Chief Lunau pointed out last evening at our public outreach meeting, um, there are, I believe it's 40 female officers. Uh, about four, 40 to 50 total female employees. 40 to 50 total female employees and one restroom in their locker room for females. In addition to that, there are some ADA issues. We have an elevator that doesn't go to the third floor. So um, to try and make this building work, as you can see, would be uh, extremely challenging. So here's a little brief project history. Uh, studies for expansion have been going on for quite some time. One started in 86, there was another in 91, and another in 98 in anticipation for the bond measure in 99, which was voted down by the voters. And that, would have, that obviously would have provided funding for a new police station. So it put a big pause on, the, on that progress. In 2011, an ad hoc committee um, studied this again and concluded the new building is, is probably the best path forward but needed to uh, verify that. So a needs assessment study was done in 2012 and concluded that yes, a new station is by far the best path. There was $20 million that was um, earmarked by the redevelopment agency at that point that went away when it dissolved in 2012. So again, a big pause in this project. There have been multiple improvements since 2012 to this older building, one of which was moving the call center out of a vulnerable spot within the building to uh, the Granada garage. And in 2017, Measure C passed, which gave us uh, the funding source. Uh, I was brought in in late April, and uh, we put together a team, and the consultant selection uh, was concluded. And Brian Cornell was our local architect that was selected. You are more than familiar with him and all of the uh, landmark projects that he has done, and we are thrilled to have him on our team. Uh, Jeff Hornbuckle is going to be also the project architect. <clears throat> As Brian will take care of all of the scope and scale on the outside and make it look beautiful for us, uh, make sure everything works with the Santa Barbara process, we also have a technical architect. Uh, McLaren, Wilson, and Lowry have, have built over 300 police stations nationally and truly are the experts in this field, and we are so excited to have them as part of this team. They will inform uh, the design on the interior as well as the exterior to make sure that this is an operational system, not just a building. MWL also was in charge of all of the uh, phase one programming, which uh, is uh, derived from uh, interviews, questionnaires, uh, studying the current operations with uh, the org charts, studying wh uh, who all is adjacent to whom, to really study what we do here to make sure that we know exactly what needs to be done in the new police station. So from all that information, they distilled it down into a working spreadsheet for us um, that really crafted our, the skeleton of our site criteria of what we needed to look for for a new station. So uh, certainly an integral part of this, and uh, again, so glad that they, being the experts, knew the questions to ask. Which brings us up to where we are today, our, the site selection phase, phase two. <clears throat> so we took that uh, criteria list and evaluated uh, all the sites that had potential. So some seemed more obvious than other, but we, uh, as we studied it, um, uh, again, I'll show you the, the criteria list in just a second, but that's, that's what we started with is, all right, what, what possibly could work? We also have a preliminary environmental review by DUDEC on each of the locations that, um, that were viable. We are in the middle of our community workshops. We had a, a very exciting one last evening at the, the Faulkner Gallery. And we have two this next week as well. Uh, those dates are at the end of this presentation, so everyone's aware. And our goal is to, um, to come back in early 2019. We're not beholding to a specific date, but 
Our goal is to come back in early 2019 to City Council and to have a recommendation from staff along with the ad hoc committee. So out of the site parameters, uh, here are the, here's the gist of what we're looking for. We'd like to have about 72,000 square feet of space and approximately 252 secured parking spots. Now, ideally, with public community spaces and uh, meeting rooms, it would be great to have, uh, and ideally, 80 public spaces, but uh, the two sites that we're looking at, that will be a, a very tall order, um, probably an impossibility, but um, adjacent lots and making sure that there is parking nearby uh, is, is one of the factors of, of consideration of these two sites. Should everything be on one site? It's been asked multiple times and in multiple ways, and ideally, yes. Uh, <clears throat> we may have to compromise on some things, but when you really understand the, the operations and the, the systems that are trying to be created um, with this new police station, um, I think you'll agree that everything should be on one site. So here's our site criteria. Again, it's not rocket science, but, it, but all of them are important. We started off with uh, the lot size. How, how big do we need? Uh, it was recommended originally. Um, if we could get three to four acres, that would be great. But three to four acres in this town is incredibly challenging. So then it's, we started looking at the different options. And taking all of these factors into consideration, I just want to draw your attention to the, the bottom two on each column. Um, the police department um, operates primarily in the downtown corridor not just with uh, their visits almost daily to the courthouse and their goings on, but that's where most of their calls are. So um, it's not that it's, uh, it's impossible to have a station outside of the downtown corridor, but when you look at the efficiency of, of shift changes, um, it's really important. Uh, it's, it's critical actually to, to have them close to the action. The second thing is the control of the property. We had multiple people ask us last night, how come you haven't gone here? How come you haven't looked at this location? How come you threw out that location? Well, the reality is, is that Measure C is not an endless pool of money. We need to also be cost conscious and to start off this project by trying to buy another property that would set us back millions and millions of dollars in the downtown corridor. We really, in, in being good stewards of this money, uh, need to pick um, a property that we own first and foremost, if we can, if it's viable. It makes the most sense for the project and um, it's the least expensive route for sure for this project. So those were how we, these, these uh, criteria are how we started bringing it down into what is a viable candidate and is it possible to do this? And we, we studied all of these. We have uh, you know, a site criteria checklist on each of the sites and while that's not a published document at this point, we really evaluated every site. So this being the site criteria, I thought I'd also throw out the ideas that everyone threw at us, not just last night, but in previous conversations. Um, the thread through all of these is we don't own them. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not great ideas. It doesn't mean that they're not um, wonderful ideas in some cases, but we don't own them. The city sites that we have considered, that we do own, but that we also uh, decided were not viable. Uh, we looked at the Parks and Recreation and Facilities offices over on Laguna Street, and it's aptly named because it used to be a lagoon, <clears throat> which means it's also in the flood zone. So it's not just a good idea to not be in a flood zone, it's actually a non-starter for us. So um, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's not a viable candidate. The Carrillo commuter lot, uh, it's 1.3 acres, so it's undersized. It is um, a one-way street in Castillo on one side, and then it has Carrillo, which basically acts as a one-way street on the other side. Those are the two access points. Being adjacent to Mission Creek, it is city policy that there's a 25-foot setback of all development. So it further shrinks and reduces the size of that property for use. So as we evaluated that, um, primarily size, I mean, it's just not big enough to fit everything we wanted, but these other variables made it just over the top for us to, to rule out this as an option. And thirdly, I put that up there because um, we needed to concur or 
refute <clears throat> the previous studies that were done on the existing police station. And our conclusion uh, is that um, we need a new location. There's many reasons, but it's only 1.1 acres. That's all three parcels, so not the annex, because we don't own it, we lease that. But the property that we control is 1.1 acres. Uh, I already mentioned the hazardous materials issue in, in the ground. But if we were to try and use this property, we'd really only be able to do a building. We wouldn't be able to do a, a building and a parking structure. So it's just not feasible to reuse this, this property. Also, if we were gonna just do a building, we'd need to relocate the entire police department to a secured facility, rebuild the police department, only to move them back for a facility that doesn't make sense. So we were able to rule that out as a, as a possible location as well. So the sites that we are pursuing, the Coda commuter lot and the Louise Lowry Davis 1235 Teen Center Spencer Adams property, um, both of which we know can work. So with that, oh, one more, one more slide. I wanted to also point out that both of these locations are out of the flood zone, um, as well as the 500 year flood zone, as well as out of the sea rise level zone. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Cornell to speak to the designs. Chair Wiscom, members of the commission, thank you. Um, Chair Wiscom, Commissioner Lodge, you both look beautiful today in your color matching. In fact, you're all very colorful, except for you, Commissioner Campanella, you're sort of gray. And you didn't wear your lucky purple shirt, though, No, today. I didn't. I, it was dirty. Sorry. Um, Okay, so we're going to start with the Coda commuter lot. Um, I want to just reinforce a couple of things. One, Jim McLaren um, really is remarkable. He's done a great job. He's worked very closely with the chief, um, not, in, in, not just to um, express and, and purport uh, his opinions about things, but really bring his knowledge and to draw out of the department what's going to be the best police station for the long term for the community. And I think there, it's just been, a, it's been an excellent process. And it will continue to evolve. You know, Brad mentioned the 72,000 square feet, which we're basically looking at these options using as an apples for apples comparison, as well as the 252 parking spaces. These things will continue to evolve and the, the way that we piece this all together will evolve. Um, on these things that I'm going to show you, these are just uh, uh, studies of how the basic program fits on these sites. They are not endless exhaustive studies, and it may be that there's some comparison or, or combination of, of choices, which I'll get into. So just you know, looking at the Coda commuter lot, this is a good shot because it shows farmer's market. And obviously this is one of the primary issues with this site is figuring out a, a place to, to uh, put the farmer's market should this be the police station. And that obviously is going to be a very, very important process. The good news there is that we have probably two and a half, three years to be able to do that before any ground would be broken on either of these sites. Um, the other thing that's important about this site, I'm just reoriented for you for the plans, but we're also adjacent to the state property, and that's the, the uh, topic of our, of our second option for CODA. But the first option is to look specifically at this 1.6 acres and to see how it fits. And at first, I will tell you, we were concerned, especially because of what Jim McLaren told us, that we weren't going to fit on 1.6 acres. Uh, but we can fit the 252 spaces and the 72,000 square feet on this site. Um, the nice thing about this site, unlike the Carrillo commuter lot, is we have two good entrances and exits. Um, and in this scheme where we are fairly tight as far as a footprint, um, we've even talked about, by the way, that there are possibilities that maybe some additional parking could be facilitated on Santa Barbara Street and discussions with public works are ongoing about that possibility if you know because obviously um, the 252 spaces just meets the police department's needs and doesn't provide any of that public parking the good news here is that we have 
um, the city parking just across Anacapa Street um, that is that would obviously be relatively convenient to serve the project. So in option number one, looking at a section, what we've actually done is gone underground. The groundwater table here, or the groundwater we know from recent testing is at about 12 feet. So it is feasible that we could put a basement in the building. We would not want to go below that 12 foot. In fact, we'd want to stay a little bit above it um, from a cost standpoint, but it is feasible. So in this scheme, we've actually gone underneath the building. One of the program requirements uh, for the 72,000 square feet is a uh, shooting range. And so um, in this case, we would put that down in the basement, which there is a lot of merit to. So in this scheme, we would go down into an underground parking area, uh, and uh, there would be safe offloading of uh, potential suspects, that sort of thing down in this area. The first floor, the main floor, would have uh, 72 spaces associated with it. And then there would be a third floor, a second floor, I'm sorry, and then a smaller third floor portion. So a good way to understand this is to kind of look at this perspective. This shows the ramping system, how you'd come off of Coda. Coda there is on your right. Um, and be able to go down into the parking structure below and then a partial level up above. So this would result in a three-story building from a public view standpoint. Uh, because part of the parking is underground, it keeps a fairly low profile to the, to the parking garage. And by the way, these are not meant, even though they are, they are uh, models, um, th this is not architecture yet. A lot of people ask me why there weren't windows in the building, for instance. Uh, there will be windows, I assure you. Looking back down Santa Barbara Street, which would probably be the main sort of entrance to the building off of the small public lot that we have associated with this. Um, this is then kind of looking at that state property uh, uh, just, uh, to the, just above it on Santa Barbara Street. So this would be a three-story building. Obviously, we can build four stories and up to 60 feet for this building, but we're trying to keep the scale down. The second option is considering use of the state property. Initially, we actually got very excited about the possibility that somehow this state property could be acquired in total and that the EDD function that exists here could maybe be relocated to another location in town. Um, that seem, that's seemingly more far-reaching than we really need to be. What we realized is that just even getting half of that parking lot would make a significant uh, or would su significantly free up space um, for the police station. So in this option, we said, well, let's not go underground then. Let's keep everything above ground because going underground does cost more money. Utilizing that portion of the state property for public uh, spaces and some utility functions. When you look at a section through this, in that scenario then we'd still have a three-story building, but our parking structure would be larger and we would put that shooting range on the top of the parking structure. You can see, by the way, in all these options, I'll be showing you the 60-foot height limit, which is a red dashed line there um, along the top of the building. So again, we're trying to be respectful and keep below that. So first floor, second floor, third floor steps back slightly, and we get to the program needs. But then again, there would be sort of a fourth tier to the parking structure, and that shooting range would sit on top of that. Now, you know, again, there, there's no reason at the end of the day there aren't combinations of these options. It may be that we decide regardless of whether we get the state property or not that some underground makes sense. Um, but this at least allows us to see the options. And in this case, this shows that you'd have a much m larger parking structure associated with the project. And the view back from Santa Barbara Street, the building would be a little bit larger from a footprint standpoint as well. So then we move to the Louise Lowry Davis site. This is a larger site. It's a little over three acres. Um, and, and so it gives us certainly more flexibility. But obviously, this is, this is City Park. 
uh, and has some important services associated with it, not the least of which is the Lawn Bowling, the Louise Lowry Davis Center, and the, and the Teen Center that used to be when I first came to town, the building department. Um, so turning this site, just so we can look at it the same way, you can obviously see the amount of area devoted to the Spencer Adams um, Lawn Bowling facility. The property that is to the right there, the old Akron that was converted to office space is not part of the project. Um, the nice thing about this site is we have abundant access off of four streets. Uh, so in this first option, what we looked at was uh, basically leaving the Louise Lowry Davis Center and the Teen Center uh, intact in place and building between them and then putting the parking structure where the lawn bowling is, uh, just as with the farmer's market in this case, if this site were the, the ideal site, uh, there would have to be a lot of work to figure out what, where the alternative location for lawn bowling is. And I think it's pretty clear from what we've heard so far that that would need to be in the downtown, not very far from this site, that, because that is where the, the need is. Um, looking at a section through this, in this option, we're putting everything above ground um, like option two on Coda, the building would be three stories. The parking deck would, would actually have four tiers associated with it. Um, the nice thing about this is we could have a, a, a direct access off of Anapamu um, that would lead us to the parking structure and the building. That access actually exists today. It's actually a little drive that goes up there, so we'd pretty much keep it in place. And then we could connect back to Victoria and Chapala. Uh, you can see I've added a little uh, 16 space parking lot that would serve exclusively the Louise Lowry Davis Center that would remain functioning with its program you know, as it is today. So it would not be part of the police department, although there could be a kind of nice symbiotic relationship between those existing buildings and the new police department. Um, the new police station, the police department is Existing, yes. <laughs> um, so second floor uh, and then a third floor and again putting the shooting range up on the top of the parking structure. So this is the view from De La Vina and Victoria so that this is not a, a, a technical rendering so that is the Louise Lowry Davis Center massing wise uh, there on the corner and then the police station um, put in between and the parking structure running down the line. And then this would be the corner of De La Vina and Anna Pamu. There's a beautiful Morton Bay fig tree there that these renderings don't do justice to. Uh, but the nice thing about this site actually is that there is a very large landscape buffer that would, would uh, shield this parking structure and also add or give us a lot of area for stormwater treatment that we lack on the Coda Street site. Uh, option two is actually looked at the, the possibility of relocate, relocating Louise Lowry Davis Center to the uh, Anapamu uh, De La Vina corner, uh, which could be really beautiful because it would have a relationship with that Monterey or that uh, Morton Bay fig tree. And so we gave it some extra space around it. Consequently, it, it uh, reduces the area of the parking structure. The building, the this police station itself then is able to reach all the way to De La Vina. It gives us a little bit more flexibility as far as a footprint is concerned. But in this scheme, just to you know, realize what the possibilities were, we went ahead and said, well, in this case, let's go ahead and go underground with some of this building as well, especially since Anapamu is down probably six or eight feet lower than Victoria, so it's kind of a natural to go in at Anapamu and down um, to a basement level that would be fully on subterranean at the Victoria Street side. And that, what that allows us to do is then really keep the massing here down to essentially uh, what is a you know, two-story building um, and then three levels of, of parking, three tiers of parking above grade. Uh, so this obviously shows a fairly scary facade along Victoria, but that would be articulated in the future. But we could step the building down to a one-story level at the corner and, and you know, cascade it up towards the more, more the middle of the site. 
Um, and again, then, you know, relocating the Louise Lowry Davis Center would really be a nice thing on this corner of De La Vina and Anapamu and tend to shield that parking structure from being such an obvious element. So those are the options that currently are on the table. And I'm going to let Brad finish up, and I'm sure you'll have questions. So now it's, where do we go? <clears throat> so our next steps are, as Brian just articulated, the dual path for design, studying both sites carefully, doing the studies for layouts, entries, circulation, all of those things, uh, continuing with the pre preliminary environment, environmental review uh, that DUDEC is doing with us, and then continue the discussions with the state uh, regarding that portion of their Ortega property. But ultimately, how do we make a decision? So it comes down to a mix of these three variables, function, cost, and time. And cost is actually a, uh, a dual meaning because you have the cost of time, you actually have the cost of money, and you have the cost of displacement. And so those factors are being taken into account when we, when we look at these variables. But each site uh, needs to be evaluated for all three of those. And ultimately, our goal is to find the ideal spot for the police station, first and foremost, with the inclusion of all of the other uh, ramifications of what that site entails. Um, I'm meeting, for instance, uh, this Saturday with the, the board for the farmer's market. So we've been engaged with them um, for several weeks. And... Um, uh, I'm looking forward to actually meeting with the board and sitting down and talking through some real concrete ideas uh, that <clears throat> I've gone through with um, staff and, and really the executive team of the city to what can we do? What can we do to facilitate that if, if the code lot is selected? So I'm excited about that possibility of, um, of if the code lot is selected, um, really becoming a team with the farmer's market. So I'd like to, if, if it's all right, I'd like to have Suzanne Elledge at this point, based on this, this next slide, which are upcoming meetings, just chime in uh, as, as our consultant for public outreach. Thank you, Brad. Chair Wiscombe and Commissioners, Suzanne Elledge from Suzanne Elledge Planning and Permitting Services, we're honored to be assisting the city with this project. Uh, we've been working with the team since August, and um, our role is to assist with public outreach. And it's important, I wanted to just relay to you all to assure you that I think that the outreach effort um, in, for this project is extraordinary, and so I wanted you to know that. This is very early on in a process to be engaging with the community. And what, what I mean by that is that a site hasn't even been selected yet. Normally, uh, when you do outreach, you already have a, a concept plan for a project, and you're proceeding through the development review process. Um, in this case, the city is reaching out broadly um, to talk about this project in the context of these two potential sites. And so I just wanted you to know that. Uh, the noticing was very robust. We went 1,000 feet. You know, typically projects go 300 feet. Um, and so we had over 5,000 mailed notices. That was 1,000 feet in each direction around both of the potential sites as well as the existing police department site along with the, the usual publications, uh, notices in the publications. Um, there was a long list of stakeholders that were identified and they got mailed notices. There was a social media campaign reminding people of the dates and the times for the meetings and so forth. So there was really extraordinary um, effort to get the word out about these two sites and to inform people. So I wanted you to know about that. Additionally, this is the sixth meeting that's been held, a, a public meeting to update various commissions on the project. Um, Brad and his team have visited the Fire and Police Commission, the Neighborhood Advisory Committee, Parks and Rec Commission, the Citizens Outreach Committee. So the point is um, there's been a lot of effort to inform the public about the status of site selection. So I wanted you to know about all that. And that concludes our presentation and update, and we are happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Hess and the project team. Um, I thought the, the presentation was, was excellent. Um, we, 
I'll open it up if commissioners have some um, um, questions. We'll start with Commissioner Thompson. Thank you. I thought it was a very thorough and excellent briefing. You mentioned one of the items that caused the Carrillo Street commuter lot to be discounted was the one-way streets. Yet both of the other project areas that you're looking at are dealing with one-way streets also. You want to discuss the issues there and why one-way streets are bad in one location but not in other locations? Certainly, Chair Wiscombe and Commissioner Thompson. The I guess the distinction would be that um, while Castillo is a one-way and Anacapa is a one-way, sorry, Santa Barbara Street is a one-way, um, I guess the difference would be between Coda and Carrillo. So Coda is the primary thoroughfare east-west um, in that area. It's actually the only street um, f the furthest south that goes all the way from one side of the town to the other. And Carrillo acts as a one-way street just because you've got so much traffic in that uh, very impacted um, uh, intersection. So while on the surface you could say that they're, they're similar in the sense of the two one-ways, um, I think it's the difference between Coda and Carrillo primarily. Okay. I have one other question, and that is when you start talking about on the uh, Coda Street site perhaps doing a uh, underground uh, because the water table is at 12 feet. Have you looked at what the water table might be 50 years from now with sea level rise? Uh, Chair Wiscombe, Commissioner Thompson, that is a great question. Uh, it is something that we are looking into absolutely. Um, it's hard to project what the future will be. And uh, our Director of Public Works, Rebecca Bjork, would like to answer that question. Good afternoon, Planning Commission. Rebecca Bjork, Public Works Director. Um, what I can tell you about that water table is it's what's called a confined water table. So it's, it's already under pressure when it's full, um, which is why we have artesianing in the downtown. And it's confined by a clay lens, a clay layer. So that, that would have an effect on um, how it performs in the future, but I, I don't have a specific answer to how sea level rise will affect the shallow and tube, sir. Yeah. Chair Wiscombe, Commissioner Thompson, uh, we are aware of the sea level rise adaptation plan. Um, we're involved and have looked at the latest projections. And in fact, I was just reviewing those earlier today um, with staff. And the code a lot is out of the worst case scenario. Um, with respect to groundwater, I'm, I'm not exactly sure because that's not being studied in the adaptation plan, but it's certainly out of the worst case scenario area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, th I think the, um, from b being on the subcommittee, the FEMA maps were, were more important for that area than the actual uh, COSMO study that's being done for sea level rise. Is that correct? And, and um, so you're saying that it's out of the area in terms of the FEMA maps. The FEMA maps were much more um, intensely driven for flooding than the COSMO sea level rise study. Chair Wiscombe, if, if I understand, I believe the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner uh, Wiscombe, my, my point was not so much for the flood issue, but if the sea level's rising, it's going to impact groundwater levels. And I wasn't thinking about flooding, but I was wondering about what impact it may have to affect the groundwater levels due to intrusion. Point well taken. Thank you. Um, okay, we're on to Commissioner Campanello is next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, following up on uh, Commissioner Thompson's question on the Carrillo lot, I drove by there this morning, and maybe it was 30% occupied or just roughly. Uh, I was wondering if you, as part of your analysis going forward, as you look at alternatives, uh, the uh, displacement of current parking uh, being analyzed, whether it's a uh, just during the commuter hours or utilization over the weekend, et cetera, uh, whether that's going to be considered as part of your environmental review. Uh, let me put it that way. Uh, Chair Wiscombe, Commissioner Campanella, we actually met with the downtown parking uh, committee this morning. Uh, is one of the questions that was raised. It's also um, one of the issues that uh, Rob Dayton and Victor Garza are studying currently, and um, 
we will have a plan in place for the displaced parkers or commuters. Okay. Uh, uh, st sticking with Carrillo uh, and uh, one-way streets versus two-way traffic, the uh, uh, maybe you have freeway access if you, I don't know if that's a positive or a negative, but let's say the Korea lot, if you need to get north or south, you have the freeway to work with. Uh, you also have a pretty major street to get over to the west side uh, as far as, and uh, so I didn't, when you, uh, I'm just hopeful when you go through your analysis that perhaps Coda, the uh, Korea lot can be shown as a comparison when you look at the other factors, because right now I see it's down to two options. And you have another commuter lot, so I, I would hope that would be vetted uh, more uh, to show why that is not feasible uh, when you compare it to the alternatives that are being considered. Mr. Um, Cornell. Chair Wiscom, Commissioner Campanella, I want to be clear that the, the you know, certainly the one-way traffic issue of not being able to have an in and out in one location is critical relative to the Korea commuter lot, but bottom line, it doesn't fit. I mean, I can, I'm barely fitting the program on the Cota commuter lot, and that's, you know, 1.6 acres as opposed to 1.3 acres without the 25-foot setback, which we know Creeks is going to ask for a 50-foot setback. So it, it, just, the, it just does not work. It, mm -hmm. it is not a viable option. Okay. So that, there would be a 50 foot, uh, asking to be a 50 foot setback, even though that's a reinforced creek with concrete? Yes. You'd have a, Still. well, you'd have a, by ordinance, you'd have a 25 foot setback, but we know that what we will be asked for is a 50 foot setback and, mm -hmm. you know, probably, you know, some consideration of revegetation, but with the 25 foot setback alone, you just are too constrained. You can't fit it all there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I can then maybe looking at alternatives, the armory property that the school district uh, appears to be in negotiation to acquire. Uh, th they are going to have to do, uh, I presume, there's some retrofitting and updating that has to be done on that physical space. If that physical space were ready, let's say user ready, does that square footage accommodate the police department or would that it just that design of that building just would not fit your requirements? Uh, Chair Wiscom, um, Commissioner Campanella, are you referring to just a temporary location for the police department, or are you referring to a long-term solution? Uh, well, uh, uh, let's say long-term solution. Uh, uh, no, I'm talking, let me put it this way. I'm considering if, in fact, the current location can be reutilized where you're located, that there's not problems with soil or it's large enough, et cetera, uh, would the armory serve if retrofitted and upgraded, would that serve as a temporary location while the current building is torn down and a new building put in its place? Um, Chair Wiscom, Commissioner Campanella, it's in the floodplain, so it doesn't work. Um, but, but furthermore, you know, I, I just want to be very clear about the existing police station site. It's smaller than the Carrillo commuter lot. It's 1.1 acres. Um, and, and so you, you combine the fact that you have a too constrained site and the fact that you cannot afford to move the police department twice because you, first of all, it's, it's, it's not practical in that you could not find a secure, you could not create a secure facility for the two years that they'd have to be in it. So you're compromising the force, you know, for two full years in that, in that, unsecure situation and you've spent you probably have spent 10 or 12 million dollars to do that you know that is the budget that you need for the new police station so it, it just is not a practical approach to this problem okay so it wouldn't it's in the floodplain but I mean let, let's just talk about as far as the dollars expended would a, a portion of those dollars that are expended some portion uh, whether it be for retrofitting or security purposes, wouldn't that also, could that also be a benefit to the school district where funds may be able to be pooled where it's done efficiently when they take over a building there, it would be set up for them where they wouldn't have to retrofit it themselves and money be pooled from both sources? 
Well, it's it's an interesting idea. You know, it 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 certainly could be a real benefit to this school district. Um, but I just don't think you can, with that site, that what I know about the site, and maybe some others in the room know more, but you, you, have, you also have hazardous materials on that site that probably can't be resolved for a number of years all by itself. Um, but I'll tell you this, uh, it, retrofitting anything to meet the, the safety standards required of a police station um, will cost much more money than building a new building from scratch. It's just too hard to do it. You know, one of the buildings that I know we were excited about initially was the Verizon building as a, as a downtown location that's got lots of square footage, you know, the old GT&E on, on Cannon Perdido and, and Chapala. Um, but essentially what you would be doing is gutting that building and completely building a new building inside of it and keeping the facade of it. So again, you're gonna spend more money in the long run to retrofit something than you would to build a brand new, appropriately designed building. Well, I, I thank you for those explanations. And maybe if uh, you may already have this, we haven't seen it because we haven't seen the detail. I mean, to show maybe on those two locations, which look like what the public might ask about, that if those explanations are documented, uh, I think it would be really good for your, your analysis and your environmental report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Campanella. Commissioner Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have some preliminary questions, and perhaps after public comment, I, more may, may come to mind. First, I wanted to ask about public outreach. Uh, and uh, two communities or constituencies in particular, I thought I heard from Sam Adelson at City Council this Tuesday, Tuesday of this week, uh, say that the first head of farmer's market. The first he had heard of the CODIS site being considered was through the media and not from the city itself. So I want to ask about early proactive or not outreach to the farmer's market organization and community. And then I have one more outreach question before. Mm -hmm. Chair Wiscombe and Commissioner Schwartz. <clears throat> I'm actually, I was puzzled by that comment actually because I met with Sam, I believe it was October 10th. Uh, at De La Guerra Plaza after a uh, city council meeting, uh, explained what we were thinking, that we had narrowed, down, uh, narrowed it down to two sites and that the code a lot was one of those locations and wanted to begin the discussion. So um, unless he had, he, I believe that was the first he had heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I was puzzled by that comment as well. Okay. Um. The next question about outreach is um, when did, when or, or has the city reached out to the senior lawn bowling community to meet privately with them just on their interests, uh, their needs and concerns regarding the Spencer Adams redevelop, potential Spencer Adams redevelopment? Chair Wiscombe and Commissioner Schwartz, um, the first public meeting that we held was at the Neighborhood Advisory Council, which is, was held at the Louise Lowry Davis Center. Uh, the lawn bowling community was notified through Jill Zachary, who is the Director of Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. She had met with them the previous week and had informed them that the Louise Lowry Davis Center was um, one of the uh, possible locations and that uh, it was their opportunity to come and understand where we were in the process and to understand how it uh, that came to be similar to this update. So um, that was our very first public uh, community outreach meeting. Uh, subsequent to that, I have not sat down with them as a whole to talk through any issues, but um, I have uh, had one-on-one -on -one discussions with several, uh, exchanged emails with several, um, but we have not sat down specifically with them uh, as Jill Zachary had done that previously. But there, okay. it would probably be a good idea. I'll, I'll discuss that more in my comments later. My next question is um, about site identification. You, you and I appreciate, Mr. Hess, you and I exchanged some emails over the course of this week with the number of questions I had. I'm wondering if either as part of the list you have in your presentation and that you shared with me before today, uh, and maybe perhaps additional uh, properties not owned by the city, if there were any discussions about those property owners or a property owner 
uh, willing to donate or have engage in some sort of a beneficial financial transaction with the city if another site, one or more other sites, would be I more ideal than the two sites that the staff has narrowed the list to contain today that we're looking at. Uh, Chair Wiscom, Commissioner Schwartz, um, I had that exact uh, idea with um, the news press building and tried to uh, communicate to uh, Wendy McCaw through uh, a mutual contact. I was unsuccessful in being able to uh, communicate with her. Um, but that would be a great idea. Um, we also, in, in one of our first media uh, releases, also requested any property owners who had property who were interested in communicating with the city as for a potential location to please get in contact with us and we provided their information. And as of today, no one has done that. And when you say news press, I just want to be clear, since um, Ms. McCaw owns a number of non-contiguous properties downtown, mm -hmm. were, were you also looking at uh, the parking lot that, right, that she owns that's across from the actual building? Because I, I know from being here at City Hall so often that, that is, uh, there's great capacity there. It's not highly utilized. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if... That was yes, part Commissioner of Schwartz, uh, that would have been part of my conversation if I had had the opportunity to have that conversation. Absolutely. I see. So you didn't even, you couldn't even get some traction there. No, is what you're I did saying. not. Okay. Well, that's too bad. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else we could have done. You know, I, I read through the media uh, that other cities have land donated to city and county governments for a variety of reasons um, for. Uh, community benefit, which I think our you know, first responder police station would be, so that's disappointing that we weren't able uh, to move that forward, especially on properties that may have been more ideal and less impactful societally, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, let's see, then I just have, um, if I could, so for the properties, uh, Louise da Lowry Davis Center, Spencer Adams, those together, and I asked you this, um, they will require a vote of the people. It will not simply be a decision at city council. Um, and you and you explain this to me and that's why. So I'm, I'm wondering what the timing would be. Let's just say, let's play this out, that should that property, and I separate out teen center because that doesn't trigger a vote of the people according to, is that correct, from the information you and I exchanged? Commissioner Schwartz, my understanding is that it is all one uh, zone park, parks and rec. So all three um, parcels. Okay. So we, all three would hmm. be included Even though it's a different park. APN. All right. It is, yes. So let's just say those three, all, all the APN, all the parcels that, uh, that contain the, da the Davis Center, the Teen Center, and Spencer Adams, uh, uh, any change of use and redevelopment would require a ballot measure and a vote by Santa Barbara voters. Commissioner Schwartz, that is mm -hmm. correct. So what would be your proposed timing then on going out with a ballot measure, since that would be required there? Commissioner Schwartz, the, uh, the goal would be then to have all of our ducks, proverbial ducks in a row by June, which is probably the latest. June of 2019? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to get uh, anything on the November ballot. So that would require um, all of the studies, all the recommendations, all the site plans, everything ready so that the voters could then make a, uh, an educated vote. Okay. And what I wasn't clear about, and again, I want to tell you how appreciative I am of our email exchanges that helped me prepare for today. What I'm not clear about, and even from the presentation, perhaps we, you could put up a slide that shows um, the best overall proposed configuration of, the, of a new police station on these parcels. Um, I'm not clear on which buildings would be proposed to remain versus moved or redeveloped and how that would give us the total number of square feet that we heard was required early on in the presentation. Um, Let's see, and I'll go to, if we both go to look at that slide that you have. So um, ideal site parameters, this is slide nine. 
And what you have here is the building requirement would be approximately 72,000 square feet. So is you know, contiguous, non-contiguous? And then back to my question of how does that fit with this site and the buildings that are currently there versus a plan? Chair mm -hmm. sure, Wiscombe. Commissioner Schwartz, to be clear, in the case of the Louise Lowry Davis site, we would retain the existing two buildings that are currently on the corner of, one is on the corner of Chapala and one is on the corner of, of mm -hmm. De La Vina at Victoria. We do show an option where we move the Louise Lowry Davis Center, but it would still remain on the site. The building there that would be demolished would be the Spencer Adams Lawn Bowling Center itself, mm -hmm. which runs parallel along De La Vina. Um, so, so those functions would remain, presumably they would remain to be programmed by the Parks and Recs Department. Um, in the case of the Louise Lowry Davis Center, it's just that the land mm -hmm. itself would cease to be park at, mm -hmm. you know, given the vote of the people in order for the new facility to be built. But it, it, I hope I'm, I can answer your question. Certainly the 72,000 square feet, there is no question that the ideal there is that that all be programmed in one building or in, yes. in contiguous space. So for example, it is possible, and we've spent a lot of time talking about this, that we could bifurcate the, the shooting range. See, so you talked about sharing the shooting range facilities with the county of Santa Barbara out towards the airport somewhere. Mm -hmm. So is that possible? Yes, it's possible operationally. Would it make sense? Probably not. You'd have policemen, police that would have to uh, do their daily training and they'd have to drive all the way out to Goleta and then drive back and it just doesn't make you know, sense if you can avoid it. If you can't avoid it, those are one of the things that you could possibly split out. But we have, we have chosen to, to strive to have the whole thing be together so that operationally the police department can function in its ideal capacity. Sure, sure. Um, and then uh, regarding this same property or these parcels, <coughs> Um, and the historic aspects of, um, so the teen center is on the California inventory of historic resources built in 1922. We had an exchange about the Louise Lowry Davis, uh, center and it's, uh, that it is a, st a structure of meritless. So, um, given that we've had so much discussion at planning and the design review boards about sensitivity, uh, sensitivity buffers. Uh, in development and redevelopment around historic resources. I wonder if that's been taken into account in some of these preliminary designs and how you would configure sufficient um, police uh, buildings and resources uses on the property. Well, to, you know, ultimately we may need to, if that were the selected site, I think that it, it clearly, I have to tell you, my personal opinion is that if that were the selected site, we, we wouldn't want to move the buildings that are there. We'd want to leave them intact and preserve them. You may know that Louise Lowry Davis uh, center actually went through the Historic Landmarks Commission with some remodel work recently yes. that was yes. that was approved as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, the real issue there is compatibility with this new building and do I believe that we have the space, the distance between the buildings to make it work? Um, I think so. Certainly I'm not going to put a three-story facade five feet away from the Louise Lowry Davis Center and assume that that's going to be compatible and all of that would have to be vetted through the mm -hmm. Historic Landmarks Commission process. But mm -hmm. clearly the new building would have to meet the standard of compatibility with those historic resources. And, and one thing is also very clear that should we, should we choose to remove any of those uh, resources, which we, we've decided would not be a good idea, that would trigger an environmental impact report, which would further delay, you know, the project from a time standpoint that Brad talked mm -hmm. about. So that's why those buildings would remain. And we believe yeah. that on the second option, moving the building would, would be able to be justified and, and not trigger a negative impact. Um, I'll just share with you, Mr. Cornell, I'm, I'm having a difficult, I know these aren't our, um, 
artistic renderings, we're not that far, so I understand that, but from some of the slides that you've shown, I'm just having a difficult time imagining how this would uh, pass uh, approval in making findings of that sensitivity um, size bulk scale design right next to these historic resources. So you have, I know that you have miles to go, uh, even beyond a vote of the people, but I'm just, um, this kind of just jumps right out at me in that regard. Um, I think that those may be my questions for now, Madam Chair. Let me just, if I could, quickly go through. Um, I think that's it. I'd like to hear from the public, and then I may have more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz. Commissioner Lodge? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there was a question and some comment about the uh, armory on uh, Cana Perdido. And could you, it, and it was said that there are issues with um, contamination there and so on. Aside from those, is there, has, have, you, have you explored the possibility of sharing that site? It seems like a very big one. It's almost an entire block, as I recall, which would be over four acres, right? And has there been any contact with the school district and what their plans are, whether they intend to use the whole thing? Chair Wiscombe and Commissioner Lodge, um, we have not reached out to the school district to discuss their plans. Um, they made it very clear in their public uh, documentation that they don't actually have plans themselves. So they don't know what they're going to do with the property. Uh, the contamination, as I understand it, is lead dust. Uh, it's in, permeated throughout their basement. I don't know if it's soil contamination as well. Um, it doesn't mean it can't be mitigated. It just means that it's going to be a while. Um, but it does bring us back to two issues. One, it's in a floodplain. Uh, two, we don't control it. And three, it's whatever their plans are, we probably would be in their way if, unless it's truly a temporary uh, location for us. And at this point, um, as was already discussed, that, does, that seems impractical. Yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense. On the uh, Castillo Carrillo site, I'm having, as I'm sure everybody in this room has, tried to get on the freeway going north during rush hour that would be an impossible situation for a police station and officers trying to get over to the west side or up the freeway, it seems to me. Am I misreading that? Commissioner Lodge, we concur. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that brings us back. And then, then the, the public in Santa Barbara has been loath to sell park property. Uh, when it's been on the ballot. Uh, so it seems as if the most likely site is the Coda site. Um, well, maybe I should save this question for later, but I'm, concerned what, I'm wondering what the city is willing to do or is ready to do to assist the farmer's market find a new location. And to help my, I spoke to one of the vendors last Saturday, and he said his experience has been whenever a farmer's market has been moved, it takes a long time for it to come back up to the level of activity that it had before, even if it's within sight of where it was before. So there will be some real issues there to consider. Okay, thank you. Was that a question, or you... you well, no, did you want to respond to that, Mr. Hess, what the city is willing to do for the farmer's market? Um, I think you explained this morning at the downtown parking committee, and I was there and saw Mr. Hess's present presentation there, and one other time, too. But <laughs> at any rate, um, you did have some comments about the farmer's market and, and the... Um, chairman of the board or president of the board was there and she did speak to the committee this morning. So would, would you just like to comment on that? Chair Wiscombe, yes. Uh, as I said, I'm meeting with the board this Saturday at their board meeting. Uh, I've been engaged with in conversation and discussion with um, multiple times with their current board chair, uh, with their general manager, Sam Edelson, with the um, previous executive uh, director of the Farmers Association, uh, as well as um, one of the, she wasn't the original founder, but has been there for 25 years. Um, and all that, as well as multiple other farmers in, in smaller discussions. 
the reason I say that is just because uh, it's, it's a learning curve. I'm not a farmer, but I have uh, learned quite a bit in the last three weeks. And um, having grown up here, um, my parents have been avid farmers market attendees every Saturday they are in town for the last 25 years. Um, anecdotally, they will go wherever the farmers are. Um, but what that will require is a space that they can get behind, that they can see as not just potential for an equal exchange of space and a commensurate circulation, parking, access, all of those things, but that I believe we can improve on their existing business plan. Um, I, I really believe that no business is perfect, so we've challenged them to look through those opportunity uh, lenses. Let's figure out how we can improve this. Um, yes, there are uh, the examples that people can point to um, of things that have failed in the past, but that is not a foregone conclusion. And um, having moved in my previous life multiple departments in healthcare from one location to another without too many mishaps of patients getting lost and people still being cared for, it can be done, and it can be done efficiently, and it can be done with a plan, but mostly they need to buy into this idea, and we need to come up with the plans on how to assist that and how to help facilitate that all the way through. It's not going to be a simple, okay, there's your location, go for it. We will be there. Uh, we are already supporting them, and we have, as uh, um, Rebecca Bjork pointed out, we've, we've already been supporting them for 35 years. We're not going away. Now it's the time to, okay, we'll step it up. And we're trying to figure out what that means. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hess. Um, okay, I have just a couple questions. Um, you, put, you had this slide on function, cost, and time, which I don't have in my packet, but I thought that was an interesting slide. So are there any functions at... Um, either one of these locations that cannot be included due to site constraints or for another reason. In other words, we'll both have animal control. Okay. And um, how about what, what's happening with 9-11 call dispatch? Is that going back to the police station? And that'll be at both locations. Chair so Wiscombe, yes. yes. Okay. So are there any functions that, that one of these sites can handle that the other one cannot in terms of your program for the new police station? Chair Wiscombe, no. Okay. Great. And um, let's see if I had any other questions. Um, in, on that same slide, function, cost, time, since that kind of thing interests me as a landscape architect, but the, um, the um, time, do you view the the time constraint for November ballot, if the Louise Lowry Davis site is chosen, do you view that as a time constraint? Um, or will, would, in other words, do you view that as something that might slow down the process versus the Coda Street lot? Chair Wiscombe, it most definitely would slow down the process because it would require about a, a 10 to 12 month delay before we could get an answer on whether or not we could use that property. But it is one of the variables that we're looking at. Obviously, that's, as you just noted, it's, it, it's thrown into the mix. What we'll be doing over the next several weeks prior to this um, recommendation is, is weighting each of these variables. Currently, right now, we've been looking at them sort of in a static way, but now we need to go th back through that and weight each of these variables um, because that will end up helping us define the right choice. Okay. Thank you. That's very well put. Um, let me just see if I have any other questions. I think most of them have been answered by my fellow commissioners. Um, oh, just one last question. Is there any advantage to on the Coda Street lot um, to having the station located there because it's so close to so many other city offices? Um, you know, community development, parks and recreation. I mean, they're all kind of concentrated city hall down there. Is Would that be an advantage versus the Louise Lowry Davis Center site? Chair Wiscombe, I'll just speak freely on this one because I'm not sure, but I think occasionally it would be convenient. Most of the 
uh, convenience actually would be uh, if it were closer to uh, City Hall. The existing station is about as close as you can get, and that's incredibly convenient. Um, I'm not sure about community development or the other uh, yeah, I, facilities. Yeah, I, I just threw those out there, but um, okay. I mean, there's just a great concentration. You can walk from, you know, community development on Garden Street up to City Hall, and um, Mr. Cornell wants to say something. Yeah. Um, Chair Wiskwin, I just wanted to add that this isn't necessarily your question, but I think it maybe has been on your minds. One of the questions we asked the chief is, you know, and, and her staff is, does it matter from a freeway access standpoint? And I think their feeling was not really that, you know, access to the freeway isn't that fundamental of a of a need that there is a difference between the two sites from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. But is the, okay, so to follow up on that then, is the Coda Street lot being more downtown than Louise Lowry Davis Center, at least that's the way I look at it, is that from a response call time a better location? Yeah, go ahead. Chair Wiscom, uh Chief Luno and I actually exchanged uh, emails on this particular issue and um, response time is uh, is hard to calculate because it's really about the patrols they're already out right so it's okay. not a response time from where the central station actually is but um, response time in a switch change of shifts is important so the efficiency of getting from the station to their area of patrol is also critical so that does affect response time but it's really challenging to actually measure response time because the patrols are out. Okay. So, so you, you don't have a, then a measure for the shift changes response time then at, at all? No. no well, it's, on one it, site versus the other? No, we do not. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then my final question is um, a little bit different for programming. Uh, I know programming always starts with the wish list of everything. Are there things on the programming list that that might uh, be pared down? Um, I've worked on police station uh, uh, vehicle custody buildings, you know, where they crime vehicles and stuff where they're held and things like that, and and also on things like when you bring someone in under arrest, it has to be in a really secure area that, that the public can't access. So are there any things on the program list in, that might be eliminated or that perhaps can be, or is this all, it's not a wish list, it's a, it's a must-have list? Chair Wiscom, it's a great question. Um, what we have in the 72,000 is the wish list. Um, it's a needs as well as wants. Um, so the great part is that when you're able to fit everything that um, has been asked for, then building less will fit even better. Um, part of that ebb and flow of where that square footage will end up, um, maybe more of a function of where it will go in the building and then massaging that square footage. It uh, may be a, a reflection of parking. It may be a reflection of, of a number of variables. Um, but at this point, the nice part is we know that we can fit everything on that site, what it'll end up um, as part of the process. Okay, that, that's great. I mean, I, I wish for everything on your list, you know, when this facility gets built, because I think you, you all deserve it. Um, it brings me to one last question, which I hadn't thought of before. I'm sorry to take up so much time, but um, at, at the current location, We've looked at projects over there. There's a lot of complaints about parking I, on the street. I know there's a lot of police cars that reserve spots on the street for police cars. Um, I think particularly on Anapamu, is that right? Or um, At any rate, so when you talk about parking for this police station, that takes all the police vehicles off the street. And you, you, you don't need to reserve any on uh, any street parking for police vehicles is that correct chair wiscom that is correct okay okay that's that's a relief okay because <laughs> i know that really impacts that neighborhood there okay thank you very much for those i think um we're going to move on to public comment um i have only two speaker slips here is any three speaker slips okay anyone else here to speak for public comment okay uh thank you 
Um, our first uh, speaker is Anna Marie Gott. And Ms. Gott, um, when you're done speaking, could you fill out your own speaker slip? Oh, I thought I already gave you one. Mm, well, you gave me one for general, but you didn't give me one for this. So we. Um, we I apologize. I. Get, I, I filled have, out. You have you you have three people that yeah. are giving yeah. you their okay. time. Okay. okay. So uh, Sharon Adams, in, is she here? Yes. There she is. Okay. Uh, Edward Bailey. Okay. Okay. So you're ceding your time to Anna Marie, and um, Thomas Stanberry. Yeah. Okay. Great. So you have. Pardon. <laughs> she, she, she's using her time. Oh, okay, okay. So you're so you're Sharon Adams, and you want to speak. Okay, then. Okay, so I'm going to switch this. Um. Um. Maybe we just need to fill them out again. Okay. Are, okay. So let me ask you this: missing slips. Are you are you wanting to speak? Yes. Okay. You're wanting to speak, not give your time to Miss Gott. Okay. I'm I'm sorry to ask you to. Let me just make sure. I. This is all I have. Um, what are your names? Janet. I have your slip. And who? Yes. I have your slips up here. I think they I, got I'm, confused when he, um, you started talking about people conceding time to me. Okay. So, no, I was only talking about people giving their time to Miss Scott. So, <laughs> that's all. So, you're rest assured we have your slip. They're not missing. And so, you have six minutes, and yes. you may start. Thank you. Pardon? What's your name? Thomas You're not... Giving your time. No, I oh, I thought he was. That's what it was filled out for. <laughs> okay. Ms. Scott, you have, just to verify, Edward Bailey is giving his time to Ms. Scott. Okay, great. You have four minutes. <laughs> Commissioners, one thing I would like to bring up is that the Brown Act allows in a legislative body, which you are, to actually call an emergency situation if you have new information that is brought to you during the meeting. You can open a discussion with a second, and if you decide to go ahead and take action and um, request that a report or something else come back, you need a two thirds majority. So Is, the information are you talking about the police station. I, I'm okay. Because it's, you need to talk on the item on the agenda. Please. And if you hold on just a second. Um, so one of the things that we're talking about today is the police station and where it will be located. We've got two locations basically. But the thing is, is that you also have other land that you could actually go ahead and use. And I don't believe that it has actually been analyzed. And that would be the Santa Barbara Municipal Golf Course. I don't know if you are aware of this, but the number of people who are actually golfing is declining substantially. Golf courses actually cause a lot of ecological harm, especially with water. We don't have a lot of water here in Santa Barbara and actually continuing to use the chemicals as well as depleting the water um, for other uses, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. If you actually look at the number of people who are golfing today, it has decreased 30% in the last few years. They've gone from 30 million users to 23 million. And guess what? The most poor popular form of golf right now is not an 18 hole, but a nine hole. Moving your police station, as you just heard, why in the world would we put it downtown? You have constrained lots. There is no, there is no additional uh, benefit for response time. And in this case, this would be right off the highway. While, yes, they don't see a lot of benefit right now, it is the perfect place.
place because you would have the ability to grow in the future. Right now, we're talking about a 70-some thousand um, square foot building, but that fits our need now, but not in 40 or 50 years. But a different space outside of the downtown would fit your needs now and in the future. And it is much better place to actually have. Right now, we know we have a housing crisis. That housing crisis in the housing task force, we talked about using the commuter lot for CODA as the first floor for the commuter lot and the second and third floor or maybe fourth for affordable housing that we desperately need. We do need a police station, but we also need housing. And the housing is far more critical in my estimation to be downtown and the Lowry and the, and the lawn bowling is the wrong place for this. If you're going to increase the density downtown, you are reducing the livability and we need essential things like that for liv livability. Our parks are not safe. We had a child that got pricked with a hypodermic needle over at Veracruz Park. I went to the planning commission and the city council last week about a child who ate marijuana at Alex Kleck Park Park and the mother is now being investigated by the Child Protective Services. We do need both things, but I don't think that we've really looked at the right places for the police station. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is um, Thomas Stanberry? Yeah, okay. And that'll be followed by Sharon Adams. Just let me go back to two minutes here. Bear with me one sec. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, I applaud the presentation. I thought it was well done. Uh, as an aside, besides my prepared marks, I am a farmer. Uh, I am a producer and I am a vendor in farmers markets. And I agree with Mr. Hess. The public will go where you are. I have moved farmers markets, not in Santa Barbara, but in others. Um, I, I would also think that we should appreciate the cost of the uh, place of development. And I believe that there will be expenses involved in the Lewis Lowry site that are not even foresold. I don't know the cost of an election, but I'm sure you do. And I know that historic buildings being moved are tremendously expensive. Um, so I would, I would say that that's probably not our best choice economically. Um, finally, I would like to think that part of the conversation uh, would be benefit, the conversation would be benefited by knowing what is going to happen to the existing property. When that police station is done, I've heard nothing of where that, where that property will go. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for speaking. Okay, Sharon Adams followed by uh, Karen Hughes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. My husband and I live only one block from Spencer Adams Park, one of these two sites being considered. We're adamant that our residential neighborhood is not an appropriate location for a multi-storied police station and garage. Hundreds of residents at the nearby Edgerly Apartments the Garden Court Retirement Home, and other dwellings would be severely impacted by a huge structure from which vehicles would come and go seven days and nights a week. Of course we need a new police station. However, with technological advances these days, why is it essential to have all police operations under one roof. That's a luxury. Why does a shooting range need to be in our downtown? Why does animal control need to operate out of our neighborhood? Spencer Adams Park is an important cultural and historical feature of our city. Since 1929, 
The Davis Center has been a community and recreational gathering place. The Santa Barbara Lawn Bowls Club began in 1937 when the Works Progress Administration built the first bowling green. Residents of all ages, teens at the teen center, working adults and seniors all enjoy this unique open green space seven days a week. Don't forget that Measure C funds are also to be used for protecting our parks, youth, and senior programs. Spencer Adams Park offers all these services. We must not eliminate a downtown treasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adams. Appreciate it. Okay, Karen Hughes, uh, followed by our final speaker, uh, Janet Napier. Napier. Welcome. Thank you for having us. I'm going to speak from the heart. I'm not written this down. I played a game today. I got three on the jack. I've never been athletic, and that means getting it where you want to get it. Others knocked me out, but that's okay. Afterwards, we decided to come down here. On the way, we had a sandwich at Subway. My husband and I sat down, and I started thinking. We just spent some money on State Street. We have folks from Carpinteria. We have folks from Ojai, from Goleta, and Santa Barbara that bring their business in here after they've played a game in the afternoon. We hosted the um, Castanola Pescaderos, a group of 40 men with their wives. They came in, uh, sandwiches were brought in, tacos were brought in, they all had a good time. Afterwards, they take a stroll through State Street because they're conveniently parked. They're bringing business to our failing businesses in Santa Barbara. And we need that support. We also need the police department, definitely. I honor them for what they do for our city and don't want to be playing Monopoly with them, but I hope they can find a better location. In closing, I would like to read to you a plaque that means so much. The Santa Barbara Police Department was built in 1959. In 1956, Spencer Adams Clubhouse this building was erected through the generosity of Spencer L. Adams and dedicated on this day to citizens of Santa Barbara for recreation purposes. John Ricard was the mayor, Berkeley Blake was the park commissioner, and McDerm Thomas McDermott was the commission. I would hate to think that I dedicated property and had a will or a trust, and later it was taken away from the people that I had given it to. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, Janet, is that, is it Napier? Napier? Napier. Napier. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm the president of the Santa Barbara Lawn Bowls Club. And of course, you, I'm here to speak against the new police station. Can you put the mic? Yeah. So being located at Spencer Adams Park. I had planned to talk about the incompatibility of such an immense building in a residential neighborhood where live many senior citizens, about the noise and sirens and activity 24-7, about the loss of open space, grass, flowers, trees, mountain views, the loss of special Olympics, bocce practice and tournaments, and the loss of our 81-year-old Lawn Bowls Club and designated park named after Lawn Bowler Spencer Adams in 1956. However, instead of in expanding on these things, I want to say that I am extremely saddened that the city, the police department, and the project management have pitted two groups of Santa Barbara residents against each other, those who live, work, or play in or near Spencer Adams Park, and those who shop at the Sat Saturday morning farmer's market without any discussion for input with any of us and without providing alternatives for our activities prior to these public meetings. 
I respectfully disagree with the city's description of their outreach efforts. I don't want to, or we don't want to fight with the farmer's market people. However, I feel that we've been placed in a position of having to fight each other in order to save our own location. As I have said before at a number of these previous meetings, if the city decides to place on the ballot in the November 29 election to undesignate Spencer Adams Park as a park, our members will all be working very hard to ensure a no vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that, um, that concludes our um, public comment. And I believe, Ms. Vaughn, we got um, one... We have one uh, email that, uh, from uh, Rebecca Harden regarding that, so let's um, make sure that gets into the record, too. Thank you very much. That closes public comment. And uh, just so you all understand, this is a discussion item only for the Planning Commission. We're not here to make any decision. We're just here to provide our input. So, um, but I would like, before you all go, I would like, uh, Mr. Hess, could you please tell us about the, the um, two other public meetings, upcoming public meetings, just remind us all when and where they are, please? Thank you. Yes, Chair Wiscombe, thank you. Uh, it is on the 13th. We will be at the Franklin Center at 5.15 to 7. And on the 15th, we'll be at Lacumbra Junior High also from 5.15 to 7, and I'm going to put this up on, oops. Thanks. Just like that. I was gonna put it up on there, but that's the time. Th that's, that's all right. So the 13th at Franklin Center, 515 to 7, and the 15th at La Cumbra Junior High, 515 to 7 p.m. Okay, so that gives you two other opportunities to come by and um, say what you want to say. I truly appreciate you all being here today and giving your comments. I thought all the comments were excellent. They, they really were. They were, um, they were very thoughtful comments, and thank you all very much for that. Okay, so now it's back to the commission for um, questions and discussion and comments. Um, I failed to see whose light went on first, so I'll start with Commissioner Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think Commissioner Campanella had his light on first, but if you if you would like to go first, that's, oh, okay. that's just fine. What, it, that's... That's a good confession. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz, Thank you. for making that Commissioner confession. <laughs> Commissioner Campanella. No, that's okay. Thank you. Good protocol. Thanks. Uh, question and comment. Uh, the, uh, I forget the number, excuse me, but the parking lot on uh, Anacapa, uh, just down the block uh, on the other side of the street. Lot 10. Is that lot 10? What's that? 11. 11. Okay. Yeah, we haven't spoken about that lot, which for farmer's market relocation to that spot where you have connectivity to State Street through the passageway that's there where perhaps farmer's market could lead to the pop-ups and other activity on State Street, the lower area that really needs an economic boost. But that, as an alternative, has not been brought up, and it's sitting there. Uh, where... Uh, then the uh, so I'm, I'm I'm leaning towards the code, uh, towards the code a lot, even though right now it is providing parking between six o'clock at night and seven o'clock in the morning, I believe, for uh, if there was overflow needed for residents or whatever we do in the future relative to building downtown, uh, and it's also available f uh, for uh, it's pretty full up during film festival and, and those type of times. But I'd, so I'd like, you know, preserving that parking would be good. But I think to get uh, looking at Louise Lowry and what's involved, uh, I think we ought to look at that other lot across the street. And then 
when you do when you get your parking studies whether that should be reserved for commuters during the workday when activity may not be that great use it for that as well and then at night it's either a paid parking lot or some other use as we start to redevelop downtown uh, I think uh, I would suggest, I, I don't know why it hasn't been addressed, but I, I would really look at that one uh, rather than which is the lesser, lesser impact of two, two community benefits that may go away. Uh, have you looked at that at all? Chair Wiscombe and uh, Commissioner Campanella, um, those are great ideas, um, and if you will forgive me, um, it's, those are the exact ideas that we need to be discussing with the Farmers Association. And the goal is to bring several options to them. Um, one of those may or may not be Lot 11. And uh, I just feel like it's important for us to vet those through the business decision makers within the farmer's market to see if it will work. But um, I haven't ruled any of the, the parking lots or ideas out at this point with them. Um, but that needs to be vetted through them as well, and we have very much just begun that process with them. Okay. Well, I do appreciate I was at the session last night, and uh, you did have a real good turnout and yes, good information. Uh, uh, appreciate uh, comments made to steer people in the right direction, uh, show them what they could do, and a, very, a, a, a good, good presentation and uh, facilitation last night. Uh, I think uh, the reason I'm in favor of this one uh, is uh, Lower State Street needs a boost, an economic boost. And, you know, we have Farmer's Market on Tuesday, which is linear. And I, there may be some people that like the linear idea. Uh, maybe there's some that not, you know, they like floating around between wider aisles, et cetera, for selection. Uh, I heard that one comment from someone. So if you have the ability to do both, let's say, get people on state as well as have the farmer's market in the morning, where that carries over to a lunch crowd, you know, rather than just the morning. And, you know, a lot of people walk there, and now you're inviting them to get out to state uh, before uh, maybe the same time you start pulling up stakes, if you will, out of the parking lot. You, you're going to have a big crowd downtown rather than of locals, not just the tourists. So I would heartily recommend you look at another alternative. And um, we stretched a bit with the armory and... Um, uh, also with the uh, Carrillo lot, uh, I think this one might be a solution that you really don't have those type of constraints. And uh, appreciate the work you're doing, and uh, I don't have any other comments. Thank I'm you. Sorry, Chair Wiscombe, Commissioner Campanella. I just, I'm not sure I completely understand. You were talking about Lot 11 as a location for the farmer's market on, a sat on Saturday mornings. I under correct. understand that. Mm -hmm. Are, what is the third alternative that you're talking about or for the... No, I, my point was, if it, the farmer market is there, then the quota lot frees up and you don't have... The, to, for I the police understand. station, you don't have the problem with the people who run the farmer's market. Also, and I'll say it again, you have the added benefit of connectivity to State Street, an area that we're trying to economically revitalize, where your normal crowd may not be there till later in the afternoon or at night. You now have people generating out there at lunchtime. Okay. I, underst I understand. I, you know, I do want to mention last night one of the things that came up and was discussed, and it's, it, it, it's an interesting option that I'm sure we will explore, but the, you know, should CODA be the choice, Louise Lowry Davis parking lot becomes a very viable option for the farmer's market as well and could be enhanced, which it's much in need of being enhanced Anyway, so there, you know, there's those kind of options that were discussed last night. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Campanella. Commissioner Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to start with some general comments, and then I'll kind of work my way down to some particulars. First, I think, I think I can say with confidence, we all know and we all agree that we need a new state-of-the-art police station. The Planning Commission in 2011, and I was serving then at the time as well, we had an up-close personal tour of all areas of our police headquarters with a follow-on report so we know um, how deficient our current police headquarters are. And since then, there has been additional information come forward um, identifying the risks to our officers in terms of health, um, and I won't get into that, but suffice it to say, um, I'm confident that we can't just 
make some minor improvements to our current police headquarters uh, where, where it exists today, uh, and then that be sufficient. I usually don't reference personal experience, but I wanna say that a member of my family designed state-of-the-art forensic labs throughout the country. She has an architecture firm based in the Midwest. This is what she does, and we've had many conversations about the importance of modern, state-of-the-art, modern technology for what we face as a society now and into the future. And it is not what we faced in the 1950s or 60s or even in the last 20 years. So I'm strongly supportive of uh, constructing, uh, newly constructing, if at all possible, in appropriate location, a state-of-the-art uh, set of resources for our law enforcement and first responders. Now I wanna say something more broadly. I, as probably other commissioners, receive feedback from the public that there seems to be a, a strong focus, some would contend, um, too strong uh, a focus on downtown, whereas the city of Santa Barbara is much more than downtown, and it needs to be much more than downtown for all reasons of community planning and, and welfare to the community. Uh, I've received some feedback that it would send a better message if functionally feasible to have our police headquarters not downtown because of what's perceived to be an imbalance of attention and focus and um, perhaps even preference given to what's going on downtown as opposed to balancing it with the community at large in other neighborhoods, et cetera. I don't know if that was discussed. I'm not even gonna ask you if that was discussed early on. I'm just sharing some public perception that's been relayed to me. So to have a, police, a new police headquarters downtown may further um, a, a feeling and a, and a complaint by some that we continue to perhaps overly focused on downtown as opposed to giving uh, balanced attention out in the outside of downtown, okay. So having said that, I, I can't sort of in a revisionist way or armchair analysis when I wasn't part of the analysis know all of the city-owned properties beyond what's on the list that we've received today that could have been considered um, that weren't, maybe they were disqualified for other reasons. So I don't know how to comment on that, but in general, I will say, I certainly was hoping that the list was longer of city-owned properties. Um, you've already heard me say even non-city-owned properties were perhaps early discussions, potential negotiations with private property owners with whom we could strike some financial deal that would allow them to whether it's donation or I don't know, you know, that's not my professional expertise, but it happens in other cities and other counties. So thinking, what opportunities did we miss there? So now let me start to focus in on where we are today. And I was doing some additional research on, I'll call them the communities or the constituencies that I think would be societally impacted and Mr. Hess, you and I had an exchange about this by email, and I asked that one of the assessments to be done by staff and the team is societal assessment. So not just financial or environment and environmental, but also here, there are the three. You have in the, in the initial staff report to us, architecturally, environmentally, culturally, and I've asked that societally and societal impacts be incorporated into an evaluation. Because when we look at these two sites, you can already hear from some of our discussions and public comment, and me personally, I have concerns about societal impacts with both of these locations. Ultimately, I don't think I'm gonna be a decision maker on this, but I will be attending one of the public forums next week. Uh, and so let's just first start with um, the Teen Center, Louise Lowry Davis, Spencer Adams. That site seems to me to be fraught with so many complications and considerations and community uses and needs, let alone needing to go to a vote of the people, which you, know, you throw that into and it's like, wow, that's a wild card. 
How can we even plan anything when we don't know what the voters will say? And it's been voted down. A new police headquarters, we have that slide from you, which was very informative, shows how many times the voters said, no, not going to fund a new police headquarters. Unfortunately, we missed the RDA window. Um, I think that's very unfortunate for our city, but here we are. So to me, I think there are far too many issues and problems, I'll just generically call them problems, with the Spencer Adams, Louise Lowry Davis Teen Center site. Um, you've already heard from public, you'll hear more from the public about that. So now we go to the, and I'm shortchanging, shortcutting a larger conversation I could have with you, but for today's purposes, since we're not voting on anything and you're really just um, seeking some feedback and I, I hope it does get folded into ultimate decision making. So now we go to the Coda commuter lot. And I have to say that I'm probably not one of the more experienced in farmer's market. I'm not a regular goer. Many of my friends are. So I thought I would do my own research about farmer's markets, not even just in California, but across the country. And I just want to share a couple of pieces of information that I uncovered, which really made me ponder more carefully about the loss, potential loss, of a farmer's market because just moving the market itself um, may not, even, even to a desirable location downtown, may not mean the success or the survivability of the market as we've come to know it in the 35 years that we've had it in this location. So I went to the United States Department of Agriculture site and there's a National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And there was a seven year study done of the performance of the state of Oregon farmers markets. This is very big in Oregon. 62 markets opened and 32 closed. Some of that was due to relocation of markets. Now, of course, there were some other factors. I grant you that. But there's a quote by um, some of the advocates of farmers markets in Oregon under this study. Farmers markets are a great success story for Oregon agriculture overall. And ag is a big business for Santa Barbara County. So we have the financial or economic benefits. But then I also went to, if I could say, oh, let me just one more quote, if I may, Madam Chair, from, or, from our State Department and what happened, what's happened in Oregon. So they say when, when this successful form of civic agriculture it helps communities realize both their economic development objectives and their social and environmental goals. Here we are, the birthplace of the environmental movement, and I think we need to take very, very seriously every policy and community planning decision that will also affect the environmental health and the public health of our community. Lastly, I want to just reference one more piece of research that I did. Who would have known the state of Tennessee, which I want to smirch Tennessee, but I wouldn't naturally consider Tennessee to be um, a leader in some areas that I think California typically has been. But Tennessee is known to be the, the, the uh, standout state with 154 farmers markets making it first in the nation in growth of farmers markets. And in fact, what have they done? And this is going to connect with the revitalization of downtown when I share this with you. They've used the farmers' markets in conjunction with festivals, events, bringing families downtown, educating the community on public health, on healthy foods, and so forth. That's something we could also build out using far a continuingly successful farmers' market. So why do I bring this up? Because I'm concerned about moving the farmer's market. Now, ultimately, we'll see what happens with that. If we do have to move it, and I'm, I'm um, uh, what Commissioner Campanella said, that's resonating with me, maybe there is another site right downtown that we haven't considered. Let's get creative. Let's really explore with, it could even be other private property owners who have underutilized properties, and for the square footage we need for farmer's markets, maybe they would be willing to do some deal with the city. I think we really have to get creative, and I'm going to ask, this is all I can do since I don't vote on this, is to ask staff to try to move away from the Spencer Adams, Louise Lowry Davis Teen Center 
proposal or consideration, look to the Coda commuter lot, and really redouble our efforts in working with the farmers markets organization to see how can we minimize, if city council ends up going in that direction, uh, minimize the impact to farmers markets survival, sustainability, and what does that mean? So if we have to say we're committed to ensuring the survival and sustainability of that, of that Saturday farmers markets, how do we achieve that? How can we commit ourselves to achieving that? That would be my requested and really recommended path for staff, for the team, and um, ultimately, you know, again, goes to city council on, I'm sure, much of this, let alone if you want to go the other route, the vote of the people. But I appreciate you coming to Planning Commission uh, and, and hearing me out. And again, thank you, Mr. Hess, for our email exchanges. They, um, they were thought-provoking for me and informative, and I always try to, to do that in coming to Planning Commission hearings. So thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz. Uh, Commissioner Lodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. When I was in office in the 1980s, we badly needed a new police station. And that, that's why there were, there were the studies starting in 1986. So there's no question about the need. I'm inclined to agree with Commissioner Schwartz and her comments in weighing the Spencer Adams, or well, the, the whole Louise Lowry Davis lot area. Uh, as against the Coda commuter lot for, for the same reasons. However, um, and, and I am one of these people who, like your parents, I, I've, not only have I been shopping at the farmer's market downtown since it's been at Coda, uh, but when it was before that, when it was at Santa Barbara High School in the parking lot, so it's, it's a place where I go every Saturday, and it is, as uh, Commissioner Schwartz was applying, it, it's a social event as well as being able to get all your good produce. <laughs> um, so um, I'm intrigued by this. How, how essential is it to have the police station downtown? That's my question when the officers are out on patrol all day. And I, I understand that most calls for service are downtown. That's where the greater density is, more activity. But would the golf course possibly be an alternative site? <laughs> um. Chair Wiscom, Commissioner Lodge, I, I, you know, I, I've since the beginning of my involvement in this and actually meeting with public works staff just in preparation of pursuing this project, I have to tell you, I felt very strongly that they had made the right choice to keep the police department downtown. It's a, there's a, there's a civic grounding of that that cannot be ignored to put them out side of the downtown, put them out at the airport or put them at the golf course, to me removes that very important civic function from the core of our community. And it's just wrong to me. But that said, it is also impractical because you still have to have a police presence in the downtown. So you would have to build a substation regardless. If you, if you chose to put your main station out, out of the downtown, you'd have to build a substation downtown, and you would then be duplicating operational functions, and you'd increase your costs. You, you just would not want to function, and this came from our consultant, Jim McLaren. He felt very strongly about that. It's your, your core population center would have to have a substation at a minimum. So I think that I applaud the 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 police department and public works direction from the very beginning to keep this station downtown. I think it's essential. I think it's so important from a historic standpoint that it remain in the downtown. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Lodge. Commissioner Thompson. Okay. Very briefly, uh, excellent presentation. You answered almost all of my questions and, uh, 
shows that you've really been doing a lot of work. Um, I agree with the comments regarding the Coda lot versus the Louise Lowry Davis site. Uh, the Davis site, because of the need for a public vote, is an unknown that is uncontrolled by you. You can't control it and could have a significant impact on your schedule and therefore your cost. So perhaps the staff needs to retain at least two sites to show some semblance of having a choice going forward. But uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Campanella's points regarding uh, Lot 11, and it leads me to point towards the uh, Coda commu commuter lot as being the obvious choice. When you had that slide up about, uh, I think it said time, cost, and function, I couldn't help but have it recall uh, my years ago in a former life as an executive in the aerospace business doing contract work with DOD and NASA, and they kept coming to us with the mantra, faster, better, cheaper. And we went back to them with pick any two. <laughs> and that may be what you're faced with here when you're going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson, for that. Pick any two, great. I, I don't think that's what happened here. <laughs> Commissioner Lodge. Uh, another question relating to the farmer's market. Has using State Street as the, like the Tuesday market been considered? And what has been the, what have been the concerns and problems with that? Uh, Commissioner Lodge, the, um, <clears throat> the challenge with State Street is its narrowness. So you end up with a single-sided farmer's market due to a fire lane. So to accommodate the same amount of linear feet that you have at Coda, you'd end up about eight blocks. The problem with that is no one wants to walk eight blocks. And the advantage of having a rectangular um, space is that if you know you want to go to vendor in aisle one and the vendor in aisle four, you're 100 feet away rather than eight blocks away. So um, we've pretty much ruled out State Street as an option to replace Coda, um, but we are looking at a lot of other options that is uh, similar in shape, uh, that are similar in shape to the Coda lot for all the right reasons. How does the uh, Lot 11 compare in size to, lot, uh, to the uh, commuter lot? So the uh, Commissioner Lodge, the uh, Coda lot is 1.6 acres, and the lot 11 is 1.8 acres. Oh, okay. There would be the loss of the parking that is used by shoppers at the, at the farmer's market, but not all of lot 10 is used. Mm -hmm. uh, so people could use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Um, okay, I just have some comments. Um, I agree with Commissioner Sh Schwartz that the Louise Lowry Davis Center lot is, is really fraught with problems, and, and I was particularly taken by the fact that, that by one of the speakers that, you know, this was land that was dedicated to the city for parkland, and because of that dedication, it should stay parkland. It shouldn't. It, it probably shouldn't switch. So I'm. I'm. Um, I'm just not in favor of that of that lot um, of that site for this. I think. I think it is fraught with challenges. Um, and I also think another an, uh, another public speaker spoke about concerns of neighbors and that I've spent a lot of time there at at the Davis Center and and in that area and outside. Uh, on the patio, and um, there's a lot of neighbors there, and and the constant, you know, perhaps not constant, but frequent noise of sirens or whatever would would really, I think, be of a concern. Um, it's a much more populated neighborhood, populated area than Dakota Street lot um, has. Um, I was intrigued by the possibility of the Davis Center lot being used as the farmer's market site. I think that is an interesting alternative. And I also uh, agree that lot 11 might really work. Um, I've heard the same comments about the linearity of the Tuesday market and how that doesn't work for a lot of people. And I think they're, um, uh, from what I heard this morning at downtown parking, 
the downtown parking committee that the rectangular approach for the farmers market as as it exists now on Saturdays is the right way to go. So I think there's some um, possibilities there. I agree with Commissioner Schwartz to add societally to um, the mix for the um, objectives. I think that's important because we're dealing with with groups of people here that, that are very passionate about what they do and, and for some it's recreation, for some it's their livelihood, both are important in life. So, um, but that said, um, although I favor the code a lot, it does have challenges. Um, one of the main challenges is to find a really good alternative for the farmer's market and one they're happy with. I was pleased with the comments at the downtown parking committee meeting this morning by the um, board chairman uh, who was basically saying she was very receptive and, and um, anxious to meet with Mr. Hess about starting to explore some of those possibilities. So I, I felt hopeful about that. Um, there's other challenges. The Coda Street lot, um, I learned this morning we had the uh, revenue report. It, it generates three times the permit revenue that the Korea lot generates. And so there's going to be challenges with the permit revenue coming from that lot and, and making sure that it works somewhere else, whether, you know, and that people will buy permits to go to lot 10 or, or wherever, you know, we happen to put it at lot 11. I don't know. But, um, that's yeah, so that's another way to look at the challenges of, of that particular lot too is is the revenue generation and how do you replace that uh, elsewhere so um, so I guess I would just close with saying this is this is really important and I think the function cost and time analysis that that um, Mr. Hess showed is important and I think from the time standpoint that the Davis Center site is is unrealistic and also a very big unknown to spend a lot of money doing a bond measure and and uh, or and asking the people to vote on that and I think that's probably true at the golf course too but I can guarantee you that if you think you have a lot of lawn bowler, bowlers that are against that are against having this at the at the Davis Center, wait till you see the number of golfers because there are a lot more golfers than than um, lawn bow, bowlers. So I think um, I think the not only the proximity, I think the downtown. It's clear that downtown is where you want to be. It's part of the program and. I hope in the end that you get all you want from the police station and that you get your full program. I think, I think you will. You've got a really good team that's going to make that happen. And um, we definitely appreciate all the work you've put into this and the wonderful presentation today and answering all our questions. So I hope we were of some help to you all and really appreciate it. So thank you very much to everybody. Okay, so we're going to move on to just our final item. Uh, well, actually, second to final. Uh, item number five is the administrative agenda, uh, committee and liaison reports. Um, Commissioner Higgins is in here for staff hearing officer liaison report. I don't, do we have an altern, alternate? I don't, I don't think we have that report. So uh, do we have other committee and liaison reports? Commissioner Lodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I attended the ABR hearing on 711 North Milpas on Monday, uh, and uh, it's rather complex and confusing because it's very limited what may be done in the way of changes, and um, in any event, after uh, a long hearing, uh, they continued the matter for another two weeks. It has had... Um, Project design approval. Thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Commissioner Schwartz. Uh, two quick items, Madam Chair. First, um, because we will not, the Planning Commission, that is, will 
um, not be uh, back here until December 6th, I see from our schedule. Uh, you and I will be attending a sea level rise adaptation subcommittee meeting next. You will be attending it. I will be out Aha, of town. You will be. I will be attending the sea level rise <laughs> I've already adaptation submitted subcommittee my comments. meeting next week, and therefore I will be the one providing the update on that uh, December 6th. Secondly, and, and indirectly, uh, just some speaking of downtown. Uh, and related to housing, this morning I attended uh, the Santa Barbara Executive Roundtable uh, Forum and the general manager of Radius spoke about everything that's going on downtown, uh, residentially, commercially, and just a couple of highlights, if I may. Uh, Radius' position on downtown is that the 13 blocks of retail on state are not needed and do not work for us. So they're certainly one... Um, a one voice in the mix of the importance of working faster and smarter to uh, redevelop and revitalize our downtown area. Uh, hearing from many of the tenants and property owners, we need to do more with less space. There's some large spaces that are just untenable now and not attractive uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I don't know if Radius is at the table with the city and others. Uh, looking at what needs to be done through policy, zoning, development standards, and so forth to try to encourage downtown property owners to be uh, amenable to residential development, infill development. Uh, but T, uh, clearly, Radius is very involved and very interested in, in being at the table. And then lastly, a bright spot in terms of an important employer, and we rely on good wage employers remaining in Santa Barbara. Uh, when Amazon purchased LinkedIn, there was talk of, Am of LinkedIn moving to Ventura. They were looking at very large commercial space down there. Uh, they've been convinced to remain in Carpinteria, and their employees uh, live in Santa Barbara and Carpinteria, so I think that's good news for all of us, and that's part of the larger picture of the jobs house work, housing work ba uh, balance and what we all need to continue to work on and sure there will be more discussion at Planning Commission about all of that as the AUD returns to us for phase two, uh, I guess, the first quarter of next year. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz. Commissioner Campanella. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow-on to Commissioner Schwartz's, uh, pardon me, Commissioner uh, Lodge's comment uh, at ABR, the confusion, uh, I, uh, I would recommend, if it's okay, there's the staff report that was presented at that meeting for the project, uh, did, I think, as best as they could go through uh, where the project was. And I'm not talking specifically about this project, but wh where the project design approval versus design uh, coming next, where that all fits. And I think also it contained uh, a real good uh, uh, analogy or comments on analogy of the, uh, what we did at our meeting I was not here, but what the rest of you did to pass along your comments to a design board in general. And I think the way they summarized that and how they quoted the minutes are really good to know for us. I think an excellent job was done by staff. And I think it gives us a guide on how we would like our motions and our comments interpreted most effectively when they go on to the design boards. So I would recommend, if it's okay, that perhaps that gets circulated to the other commissioners. That would be the staff report on that project from that meeting, and uh, um, if that's okay with you and our city attorney. Ms. Ms. Vaughn can circulate that. It's public record, the, the staff report. It is a public record. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. So if you, uh, yes, uh, Ms. Vaughn, if you could just make a note to circulate the, um, the ABR Architectural Board of Review um, staff report for 711 North Milpas from uh, Monday this week. It was, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Just to the commissioners, thanks. Thank you. Uh, one other comment, if I can, uh, unless uh, the, uh, I'm jumping a little bit off liaison, but, uh, but I attended the uh, uh, Housing Authority uh, Board of Commissioners meeting yesterday, and uh, they have a draft of a five-year action plan that they would like to do. And uh, one of their goals is really to work with the city, city housing, and the planning commission on affordable housing policy. 
And uh, I really, I, I attended, I really recommended that that be done because they know uh, so much more than we do and how to be effective in housing policy. And I think if, uh, if we can actively work with them as we go through our revisions, rather than a two minute <laughs> discussion, uh, two minutes of comments from Rob Fredericks, I think if we work together, we can come up with a b better product uh, based on the knowledge that they have on the best way to make affordable housing programs work. So, the capital, capital A, this is capital A. But the capital A also included 80 to 120, which we are the missing middle as defined that we're looking at as well, and we're, we, we'd like to see. But they are working uh, on that in their charter, if you will, and they're also looking at some programs that may work uh, based on uh, programs that may have worked elsewhere around the country. So uh, I think their knowledge would really help us in a number of ways. And uh, look forward to reaching out to them, if you will. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Campanella. I think that's an excellent idea. Maybe Ms. DeBus could um, make that a lunch discussion item about how we work more closely with them and, and maybe get together with Commissioner Campanella on exactly invite how Mr. to phrase invite it. Invite Mr. Fredericks. Uh, I appreciate yeah. him as well. Yeah. So, um, Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so my only report is, um, as I said before, I attended the downtown parking committee meeting this morning at the bright and early hour of 7.30. Um, at any rate, we did receive an update on the new police station. Uh, they, um, Mr. Hess here showed us a, a lot of the, 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 the uh, preliminary uh, kind of block drawings that we didn't see those this morning. So that was greatly appreciated to actually see how something might might work on a site here today. Um, and we also had the fiscal year 2018 review. So uh, all the budget results from that. So that was that was very interesting. And um, that's all I have to report. So I don't see any more lights, and this meeting is adjourned, and thank you all very much.